Welcome to another session of the top 25 pearls in pulmonary pathology. I'm Kevin. And I'm Max. And this is our Six Patterns uh, channel. We're doing the top 25 pearls special. I was just thinking about skiing. It's going to be so nice to ski. It is winter, isn't it? It's winter time, and you know, I just took the kids up skiing. Oh, nice. It was a great experience. Nice. Really looking forward to skiing. Great. Beautiful, beautiful sunshine here in Arizona. That's right. Okay. But they're skiing in northern Arizona. Yeah, there is. Of course there is. I'm not in Phoenix that much. No, no, no. You've got to drive a little bit. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is um, the importance of clinical and pathologic correlation. in Clinical and radiologic correlation. Right. right. In the setting of interpreting ILD. Right. So the more you know, the better you are at lung pathology. The more clinical stuff you know, the better you are. So we're going to talk today about a patient who has shortness of breath and cough. <laughs> or cough and shortness of breath. Right, which is, it is the scenario for pulmonary disease, right? You get short of breath, you get a cough. This patient is a 60-year-old man, an active smoker, who presents with a seven-month history. That of, sounds chronic to me. It does sound chronic. It's not definitely not acute. Chronic Not subacute. He's already crossed over into chronic. Yep. Now, he says it's seven months, but it's likely it's been slowly progressive over a longer period of time, especially after we look at these biopsies. For sure. Now, he's got pulmonary function studies that show a DLCO of 35% of predicted. Well, so for anybody who doesn't know what a DLCO is, which, is, which was me until I had to look at these biopsies on a regular basis, if a DLCO is low like that, it means your diffusion capacity, your ability to diffuse oxygen across the membrane is shot. Right. And the lower it is, the more predictive of your overall prognosis. So pulmonary function is helpful. So if somebody says they have a uh, an FVC, force vital capacity, of less than 50% and a DLCO of 35, and you're thinking this patient's like seriously short of breath and has a serious interstitial lung disease. Yeah. So that's where we are with this guy. So he's got Two biopsies done. Let's look at the first one. This is the upper lobe. Upper lobe By the biopsy. way, I'll tell you that the, the, the imaging studies show that the patient has what is being called ground glass densities lower, greater than upper. Ground glass densities yeah. lower, lower, greater than, than upper. upper. Ground glass densities. Increased attenuation. Yeah. More white than there should be. Yeah. Lower, greater than upper, but involving all five lobes. Sounds like it. Okay. So is the diffuse parenchymal lung disease, upper and lower lobes both involved. The lower lobes are worse than the upper lobe. Now, in advanced patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, in the late stages, they will get disease in the upper lobe. So it's of worse course. in the lower lobes and yep. not so bad in the upper yep. lobe. But I, I mean, I don't know about you, but this doesn't look like UIP of IPF. Well, this Man. is the upper lobe biopsy, eh? This is right? the upper yeah. lobe biopsy. So the upper lobe biopsy looks pink. And if you were able to see our video on smoking Previous related, video. I'll put a link down below. And so if you haven't seen that previous video, topic three. I would definitely recommend Pearl 2. Pearl 2. Go back and review that prior to watching this one. Because this is a perfect segue. This first biopsy is a funny looking fibrosis. It's too much pink, too much... Squirrely fibrosis really. all over the place. But dense and collagenous. Yeah. Posse cellular. Right. Not very inflammatory. Has associated... Macrophage. Macro smokers macrophages. So this has everything that we would expect to see in it's the setting smoking of related. smoking related interstitial lung disease. It also has terrible emphysema. Yeah. Now the only reason you know there's emphysema here because it all collapses is the size of those spaces around the fibrosis. Those are huge spaces. They're gigantic. So the lung deflates, obviously, right, before the biopsy. So this is all collapsed lung, but it would have been hugely expanded with air in the living state. Right, which would look black on yeah, CT. Blacker, definitely. But we're told that this is ground, ground glass, glass opacities. There's a whole lot of things not adding up in this case so far. So... Anything else here that we should be thinking about? To me, the scar looks a little patchy, yeah. but it looks to Is me like it's airway centered. Like oh, there's look a, at this. Oh yeah, a normal alveolar wall in the middle Perfectly of this chaos. Wall. So interesting. It's not a hard interface. It's not a normal lung interfacing with a hard fibrosis nope. like a UIP. So I'm thinking this is smoking-related disease, and I'm thinking it's pretty advanced, like 
healed liner hand cell histiocytosis, exactly. RBILD. And if this is the only biopsy we had in this case, we'd call this advanced smoking-related pathology consistent with smoking-related interstitial lung disease, next case. Right. But this isn't the only biopsy because they biopsied upper and lower lobes. So let's look at the lower lobe. Yeah. Here's the lower lobe biopsy. Wow. That's a completely different picture. Same patient, lower lobe biopsy. Wow. So th this is a textbook. I mean, it's, this is a textbook case of usual interstitial pneumonia. And why, why do you say that? Because nothing will give you these windows, open windows, of normal appearing lung surrounded by dense scar. And I'll bet if we go to the edge of that scar, we're going to find characteristic fibroblast foci. Exactly. So the donut of dense scarring surrounding the open window of perfectly normal appearing lung. And along that interface, we should find some fibroblast focus activity. This one doesn't have the classic shape of a fibroblast focus, but you can see the immature fibroplasia and the fibroblast there. And the reactive type 2 cells that reactive... always seem to line the surface of that process. Exactly. And if we go along here, you'll see there's a, a little bit more here. So there, we have patchy areas of active fibroplasia, and it's all at the interface between the advanced fibrosis and the normal appearing lung parenchyma. So again, classic pathology of here UIP. from low power and high power of UIP. So I think there might be even a little microscopic honeycombing building up in that some of that yeah, denser stuff. Probably in here. You want yeah, advanced. Like right in there. Yeah, you want advanced scarring with it a uh, a cystic structure embedded within it, lined by respiratory epithelium, filled with mucus, mucus debris. Yep. That's microscopic honeycombing. So this, and it's got fatty metaplasia. Yep. It's got smooth muscle metaplasia. It has everything you want for a classic UIP. So this case actually was yep. signed out as UIP of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. A perfect, perfectly reasonable diagnosis to make in this case. But the clinician was very confused by this because the clinician had this patient's pulmonary function test. And normally in UIP of IPF, you have low lung volumes, right? right, And you have a very restrictive lung disease, okay? Right. So you have decreased recoil and increased compliance, typically, or sorry, increased recoil and decreased compliance in the setting right. of- Right, because it's stiff lung. It's a stiff, it's a right. scarred stiff yep. lung. It's yep. like cirrhosis of the lung, right? But this patient had preserved, lung, preserved volumes. lung volumes. So this is confusing to the clinician because it's, it doesn't seem to be a fit. Even though the ATS ERS guidelines do say that some patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis will have normal pulmonary function and they'll have preserved lung volumes. And we think we know why because of cases like this like one. This. Because remember back when we started, the DLCO in this patient is exceedingly low. And that would be a fit for advanced UIP, IPF. Exactly. So, Kevin, how can we put all this together? What is a way that we can communicate with our clinicians in, in some terminology that they can understand here? Well, it, it seems too simple because this is a combination of things. So let's make so a name that has the word combined, combined in it. <laughs> it, it, it. Believe it or not, this is the way the logic uh, of the people who make up names for pathology goes, So, and clinicians. So this is combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema. C P F E combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema. So how would you get that combination? Well, it's not going to be panacea emphysema, right? No. It's not going to be the lower lobe emphysema of Ritalin abuse. Or right? alpha-1 antitrypsin. Or alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's going to be a patient who's got classic distribution of emphysema in the upper, upper lung zones lobes. of chronic smoking and right. COPD. Increasing their lung volumes. Correct. Balanced against a decreased lung volume in the lower lung zones where UIP have scarred has in UIP. scarred the lung. Now, if you are into the technical aspects of the guidelines, you will understand that any type of pulmonary fibrosis can be combined with emphysema and land into this category. But in my experience, the most common scenario by far and away, right. 99 times out of 100, CPFE is seen in the setting of 
emphysema in the upper lobes with smoking related pathology and lower lobe UIP of IPF. Right. Or even a fibrotic NSIP in the lower lobes, another of the two most common fibrotic lung diseases. Those two dominate the CPFE. But remember, if you were taking a test, for example, and somebody asked you the definition, in the, and somebody said the, the answer is UIP with emphysema in the upper lung zones, that's an incorrect answer. Because UIP is not the only thing that can give you CPFE. Right. Other things can give you CPFE. That's absolutely critical to know. So combined pulmonary fibrosis, it's a difficult diagnosis to make pathologically, right? Because you're looking at this and you're saying, should I call it NSIP because of the upper lobe? Should I call it all smoking related pathology because of the upper lobe? Or should I just call it UIP? But if you know a little bit about the clinical presentation, you know the smoking presentation, you know the pulmonary function testing, it's a very nice diagnosis to render back to your clinicians because they understand what CPFE is. And it won't make any difference, right? It doesn't make the patient's IPF any worse or any better, frankly. It just causes confusion clinically. And if you're aware of it, you can help them navigate this problem. You're not going to treat the patient any differently. You know, they right. might argue smoking, for... Smoking cessation, yeah. antifibrotics. Exactly. Right. So we're not telling you that in this scenario, the patient's going to have a better or worse prognosis. This is just letting you know that these can occur together and how to explain to the clinician why the pulmonary function studies and the CT scan may be a little peculiar. Exactly. Cool. So thanks for watching uh, this this edition of the Six Patterns video and one of the, one of our top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology. Don't forget to like and comment below, and uh, we'll see you on the slopes. Thanks, Max.